Yep, so this lecture will be on the Gnostic Gospels. It's, a, it's an extremely interesting topic. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, another, it's pretty recent. It's, the discoveries of it were recent. The translations in the English were recent. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a kind of on the cutting edge. <laughs> so we'll get into it right now. The Gnostic Gospels. Start off with the discovery of the Gnostic Gospels. So in December of 1945, six Bedouin camel drivers unearthed one of the greatest archaeological discoveries this century. Uh, the Bedouin were le they're like uh, nomads, like mm -hmm. traveling tent people who live in the desert and that kind of thing. Uh, while digging for fertilizer next to a cliff in the wilderness of Upper Egypt, one of them uncovered a human skeleton next to an earthenware jar containing 13 leather-bound books, which was what the first picture was of the leather-bound books they found. This was a cache of Gnostic documents, uh, and it was found near the small village of Nag Hammidi, and has now become known as the Nag Hammidi Library. And uh, like I said, it was 13 books, and the, the, the various texts became separated as they were sold in one part was even burnt because it was deemed to be worthless and perhaps even bad luck. So what happened was there was these Bedouin camel drivers. They, they're herding camels, they're tent people, they're living, they're uh, looking for fertilizer by digging in the cliffs, right? They, they find a skeleton in the jar, they break open the jar, hoping that there's treasure or something like this inside. Inside they find a bunch of papyrus and books. They're not sure what it is because they're, they're illiterate and they don't know if it's worth money or not. But they also were kind of superstitious about it because they, they thought that maybe there was bad spirits protecting these. That they, they weren't sure what to do with them. But interestingly enough, the leader of this uh, Bedouin camel driver group, his name was Muhammad Ali, the man who, who found these uh, texts. <laughs> so that's a name that we're pretty familiar with. Um, and they, they, they were buried in a hillside in Upper Egypt. So they, they, be, they became separated, but the, uh, they were eventually brought together again and translated from Coptic, which is the language of Upper Egypt. Uh, but they themselves were translations from original Greek. But it wasn't until 1978 that translations were first published, and not until the last decade that the public had really begun to take an interest in this find. So the, like the whole story of how they found it and how it came to be in our collection is, is a little bit strange. So. The other camel driver said, uh, we don't want any part of these. We think that maybe they're bad luck or a bad omen. So Muhammad Ali takes them all to his house. And him and his brothers at the time were involved in a blood feud because yeah. someone had murdered their father. And then they heard that the man who had murdered their father was at, in the nearby town and he was asleep at the side of the road. So they, they, all three brothers went down there and they murdered him with uh, machetes. And then uh, Muhammad Ali became nervous and scared that he thought these were going to be valuable. And they would bring him money. So he said, the police are going to come looking for me because now I'm involved in a blood feud murder. So he gave them to a local priest. The local priest had a visiting relative who was some kind of scholar. He looked at them and said, no, these are really, these are worth something. We have to find where the rest of them are and we have to gather them back together. And then, so they were found in 1945, uh, but they weren't translated fully until 1978. There, and there was a lot of people interested in the translations and a lot of people nervous about it, particularly church groups didn't, yeah. didn't really want these translations coming out. They didn't the want the Gnostic, <laughs> yeah, the Catholic Church especially, and the watchdogs of the Catholic Church were, were there while people were translating them, and they, they, were, they were very concerned. Yep. about so what did, these documents would say. Did Muhammad Ali take the 13 to the priest and then... Mm -hmm. Well, he sold some and then well, gave some, some to others and some of the guys... And then so he, he gave what he had left to, to the, the priest, priest. Oh, okay. who gave them to his okay. relative who was a teacher or a scholar or But something. how did he know how many there were? Did they, say in one of the books? That's, the, that's what they, Even the scholars who study it today still say the story's bizarre and they're not sure exactly how they all came back. But even, uh, even copies of it... Like, this is a copy of it in English, the Nakami Library. But even if you if you scan through it, some of the texts have large sections that are missing. Yeah. 
Mm. You know, the large sections that are unreadable. And, and didn't uh, uh, Ali's uh, mother uh, also burn some? They yeah. used it for fire? Yeah. 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 They used it for fire because oh. it was, they didn't know what it was. Jeez. and It was yeah. really cool. They used it as like almost like kindling to start yeah. the fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so, yeah, she admitted to that. <laughs> yeah. so it's an interesting history. There's a real interesting history behind it. But within these 13 books were found 52 separate tractates that were produced sometime in the late 4th century from earlier texts. So basically, inside of these 13 books, they were, all together, there was 52 separate books. Almost like how the Bible, it looks like one book because it has a cover and a back, but there's really 27 mm -hmm. books in the New Testament and however many in the Old Testament filled with notes. But, uh, mm -hmm. And these ones, uh, the ones they found were produced sometime in the late 4th century, so like 4 AD. But they were copied from earlier texts, mm -hmm. almost like these books here. Yeah. Say they were printed in 2001, mm -hmm. but Samuel Allen War wrote them in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Just a newer version. And with, this, with the discovery of these ancient texts, the world has gained new insight into who the Gnostics actually were and what they practiced. Because it hasn't been well known, even through scholars in, in uh, history, who the ancient Gnostics were. We knew that there were ancient Gnostic groups, but the books that they studied weren't known exactly. Some of the titles were known to the books, but the books themselves didn't exist. So when these texts were hidden 1,500 years ago, it was under the threat of violence and punishment. Throughout the ages, the Gnostics have been hunted and persecuted for claiming to be able to directly experience the divine, directly. So they were hidden on, on purpose because around 1,500 years ago, as we know, is when the church started to form. They started to form what was going to be their orthodoxy, and which books were not going to be their orthodox. And, and as we'll see, this led to these being hidden. But I'll, we'll get there. So until 1945, when the Nag Hammadi Library was discovered, all the information about the Gnostics came from the books written by the Orthodox Church Fathers, which attacked them and mocked their beliefs. Uh, the main authors... Uh, being the Orthodox Church Fathers Irenaeus, Tertullian, and uh, Hippolytus, who all wrote lengthy volumes that defined and attacked what were heretical beliefs. So with the discovery of the Gnostic Gospels, the true image of the ancient Gnostics has become clearer. So modern views on Gnosticism were forced into a major reevaluation almost 2,000 years after their creation, the Gnostic uh, teachings challenged the tenets of Orthodox Christianity and enlivened the practical application of Jesus' teachings for those who could understand them. So this was the interesting thing about the Gnostics. People knew they exist, existed. Scholars knew they existed. But why did they know? Because there was Orthodox Church Fathers. The Orthodox Church would be what became the Roman mm -hmm. Catholic Church. That's right. But at one time it wasn't the dominant form. Christianity. There was many forms of Christianity, mm -hmm. and then the, then the church was formed. And so, the Orthodox Church fathers, Irenaeus, Tertullian, and, and Hippolytus, Hippolytus. I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce the names. They they wrote volumes attack, attacking heretical beliefs. So they wrote uh, one of Irenaeus wrote a five volume work on heretical beliefs. And in his book, he would quote from Gnostic books. He would say something like, in the gospel of truth, the Gnostics claim this, 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 this. But he would kind of skew what they believed. So scholars had the names of the books, some of the books, some of the gospels they had. But they didn't exactly know what was contained in them because it was through the eyes of the people who opposed them That's that right. they got their information from. Uh, these church fathers kind of made them seem like uh, that they were like wild, that they, they, they were lascivious, that they practiced kind of all the things that we associate or maybe some people like Christians might associate paganism with like wild orgies and just like weird strange behavior like this because they always attacked them and said that they were ascetic, that they, they thought that the physical wor world was evil and that way they hated their bodies so they did all these strange things. Turned out not really to be the case once we found the Nag Hammadi Library. So the discovery, the discovery of these genuine Gnostic texts shed new light on who Jesus and the Apostles were, and they give us new insight into what they believed and practiced. 
Uh, these 52 tractates that are contained in these 13 books, they are all Gnostic in their content, and they are thought to have been written down uh, 50 to 100 AD. They contain sayings of Jesus that were never before seen in the New Testament or any other books. <clears throat> it is believed that these texts were buried by the Christian monks who lived in a nearby monastery to protect them from being destroyed by the Orthodox Christian Church, which had been newly formed in 325 AD. That's when the church was formed, solidified. So there was a, there was, they, there was a monastery that was, was fairly close to where these books were found. So they thought, instead of burning them like they were ordered to do, they tried to preserve them by burying them for someone else to find 1,500 years later. So, because even in their mind, they thought that they knew these books were as old as any of the books written in the New Testament. They all claimed to be written by apostles, just like all the books from the New Testament. They just had a different point of view. The church is newly formed. Maybe these monks are thinking, well, maybe let's not just burn these right away, let's bury them and see if they change their mind on what's going to be orthodox or not. That is the most likely case of why they ended up where they did. So that's kind of a brief overview of the discovery and how important it was. Because up until that time, uh, there wasn't much known about them. There are a couple texts that people knew, a couple of letters that survived that were Gnostic, but most of the information 90% of it came from people who were opposed to them. So we're going to look at early Christianity, the first Christians. Another interesting fact is that even today scholars don't know if Gnosticism, the way it's portrayed in these books, if it predates or postdates Christianity, they're not sure if it's older or if it's newer, or if it came about at the same time, or if Jesus was part of a sect who were... Uh, they were Jewish, but they had almost a Gnostic belief. Like, mm -hmm. this group is called the Essenes. It's kind of popular in culture today, talk about the Essenes. Anyway, in the early century, uh, Christianity was a term that encompassed a, a diverse range of groups. All of these different groups claimed to have the correct teachings of Jesus and his disciples, and they all had their own books that were claimed to be written by the apostles. These groups held opposing beliefs in what it meant to be Christian. So to understand this, we can see, we can look at Christianity today and see this same kind of phenomenon happening, right? There's the Roman Catholics and Protestants and Lutherans. They all have different translations of the same book. A lot of people have the, there's a lot of Protestant religions use the King James Version of the Bible. The Catholics use the standard translation. Then you have other groups who say they're, that they're Christian, and they use their own translations of the Bible, like the Jehovah's Witness, who use the New World Translation of the Bible. And then you have groups who don't even use the New Testament, who say that, that they use it, but they also have other books that they find are more important. And they say they're a Christian. For example, the Mormons, who have the Book of Mormon, that also say they are devout Christians. So all these groups say that they're Christians. They all say they're following Christ. But the idea of how they do that seems to be diametrically opposed to the other ways of the Christians, right? Some Christians, uh, the, like Catholicism, uh, the, the virgin birth is very important. There's all the saints, the hierarchy of saints you can pray to. In Protestantism and other forms, that became less important. And ideas like this, like some, some like, I know Catholicism the most because I was raised that way. I'm not 100% positive on some of the other, but I've studied it a little bit. But I know like Catholicism, for example, they, they, they stuck to the idea that there's going to be a judgment day, and on this judgment day, people's physical bodies are going to rise, mm -hmm. raise to heaven. This is even, that, that's the tenets of Catholicism. There's many other Christian groups who say, no, this isn't true. We can prove it with science, because bodies decompose, it's made of matter. So it's not the physical body that raises on judgment day, but it's the spirit or the soul of somebody who raises on judgment day. I was raised Catholic too, but um, is cremation then... Um, something they don't do because I don't know of anybody who's Catholic who was cremated because they think right. they're going to get the yeah. body out of that coffin. I think that's where that comes from. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, they do. They think that physical or that's mm -hmm. part of their belief system. The physical body is going to so raise. You can't, you know, have destroy. ashes. Yeah. yeah. The Jehovah's also believe yep. the same. Because yeah. my father is the Jehovah's. Yeah. Yep. And they, they believe the actually same my thing. aunt changed from Roman Catholic to, to Jehovah's yeah. Witness. Yeah. But basically, what we're not really attacking any groups. We're just saying these are today. These are yeah. all these groups. We're all say we are Christians, 
But if, if I like, if I ever say I'm a Christian and I go to a Roman Catholic church and then I went to a Jehovah's Witness church, I would say, well, this isn't Christianity, or vice versa. They would say that about the Roman Catholicism. Mm -hmm. This was how it was in the early times as well. Except for if you can imagine, the groups were even more diverse than that. There was much more to it. The, the earliest, earliest Christians, they believed that you actually had to be Jewish to be a Christian. Because for them, right, Christ was the Jewish Messiah. He was from their, uh, he was the one that their book prophesied about. He was Jewish himself. So they thought, you have to be Jewish if you want to be Christian. Some of the earliest church was, was a group, and they were called, it's not important if you remember, have to remember the names, but they were called the Ebionites. And they were one of the first churches to emerge, and they said, you have to be Jewish. If you want to become a Christian, you have to first convert to Judaism. But what else that they did was strange is that they, became, they all became vegetarians, too, because they only ate meat that was kosher, that was sacrificed, but now... The Messiah came and he sacrificed himself for the people, so there's no longer a need to have sacrificial animal killings to God. So it wasn't like they, it was totally spiritual. It's just that, well, we're believers in the Messiah. We don't need sacrificial killings of animals. Now we only eat uh, vegetarian food. And then there was other groups who came along who said, no, you don't have to be Jewish at all. As a matter of fact, Jesus came. He, he gave the message, and now... Uh, that message supersedes the, the books of the Old Testament. So they said that you should not be Jewish to be a Christian. So these were the, they were called the Marcionites. And they also, none of them also really agreed on what the tenets of Christianity should be at that time. Some people thought, like the Jewish sects, they said, they said no, nope, Jesus was a physical man. He was, and at one point he incarnated a being that was the Christ. And at this point, it's, it's documented even in the New Testament at this point, although in some Bibles it was changed, what it was said, but it's, it's when he becomes baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. And he comes up and God says, You are my son, and who I have now begotten, and I am most pleased. In some Bibles it doesn't say that because they say, No, he was always divine. It didn't happen at the baptism. These are just examples of where they had differences of opinion. But there was no real set belief in why didn't they just look to the New Testament to see, uh, you know, well, okay, well, who's right and who's wrong? Let's read the book and see. Well, the New Testament did not exist. The books were written. They hadn't been collected. Some books existed in some regions and some in others, but they did not all exist together. And on top of that, there were many more books that also existed that were just as holy, that were, written, that were also claimed to be written by apostles, and all, and all that kind of stuff. That brings us to, in 325 AD, 325 years after Jesus' death, or about that, the Emperor Constantine, the Emperor of Rome, held the Council of Nicaea. This was a really important event uh, in, in the history of all of humankind. <laughs> so he holds this Council of Nicaea with the aim of unifying Christian belief and settling the theological differences. That's what this whole council is about. Emperor Constantine is thought uh, to be the first Christian emperor of Rome. The first one who, although they say that his conversion to Christianity was more of a political move to mm -hmm. unify Rome, and that he wasn't actually baptized until almost near his death. But anyways, he was the first Christian emperor. Being the first Christian emperor, he also wanted to unify what the term Christianity was. So at this Council of Nicaea, it is here that we find the first official proclamation of what is to be Orthodox Christianity. It is here that all the accepted books are gathered together to, fo to form the first ever canon of Christian texts. This canon is what we now call the New Testament. So at this Council of Nicaea, they gather together all these books. They decide which ones are going to be accepted into the canon and which ones are going to be rejected. Many books were excluded, including the Gnostic Gospels, found in the Nag Hammadi Library, and another Gnostic book of great import importance called the Pistis Sophia. So what is the canon? The canon is like their collection of authoritative books. So they decided what was going to authoritatively be Christian. They, they held, held the council. They had many of, of, of his church members go through it and decide which views they're going to adopt. 
And then after they decided what they were going to adopt, they suppressed the other versions of Christianity that existed. That is what this is actually a picture of the Council of Nicaea. You see them burning many holy books. And then up here you see that there's a little bit of hope because some of these books are escaping. <laughs> They're flying away. <laughs> so that's what the picture is depicting. So this was a tremendously important event. They didn't, um, it wasn't like, at this point, you didn't see the spread of Christianity by like the sword and anything like that like you did in the Dark Ages. But at this time, this is when they kind of put Christianity under the microscope. They said, these are what the books we're going to accept, and these are the books that we, we're going to reject. But who were they that made that decision? Yeah, that's right. Was it spiritually motivated, or was it politically motivated? Well, it's the Emperor of Rome, and most likely politically motivated, because he has... He's very interested in the politics of Rome, yes? Can you briefly say what that other book is, that Pistis Sophia? Yeah, we'll, we'll, it'll be in here, but oh, it will. we'll talk about it, and then we'll, we can talk about it after, too. It's a, it, it is a, it's a Gnostic text that had uh, escaped the fires and everything, and it reemerged. Someone found it in somebody else's library, and I don't know how that's possible. Like a personal library, they were just mm -hmm. going through his library, and all of a sudden, like, well, what's this? Oh, it's the Pistis Sophia, they translate it. It's a Gnostic text. Then there's a whole bunch of controversy. Like, well, I know we think it's only as old as maybe the 12th century, the early medieval and time. And what language was it in when it was found? I believe, it, I it, believe was it was in Coptic in Egypt. But uh, I think it's in here. Or it was either Coptic or Greek. Greek. It was all found. But yeah, so they found it. And then when they discovered the Nag Hammadi Library, the Pisa Sophia is also in here. So now we know that it's much older at least back in the second century maybe. Possibly older than that because they don't know where the sources are that these books were originally copied from, right? So these Gnostic texts were banned by the what was now now officially the Orthodox Church and they were ordered burned. Uh, the Orthodox Church eventually attempted to wipe out the words of the Gnostics from history, destroying their spiritual texts wherever they were found in an effort to reduce all opposition to the beliefs and doctrines of the Orthodox Church. Seeking to wipe out any opposition to their do doctrine, it was then that the widespread persecution of the Gnostics began, and their texts and study of them were forced underground. And it remained that way until these texts were recently rediscovered, bringing with them the lost knowledge of a small group of people who had only been known to history through those who despised them. So it's very interesting on the people who claim to have written these Gospels, who they're written by. As we'll see, a couple of these Gospels claim to be written by brothers of Jesus. One of these Gospels claims to be written by Mary Magdalene. Mm -hmm. And not that, in that Gospel, it infers that there was a deeper relationship between Jesus and Mary Magdalene. And this is where that tradition comes from. It's kind of, it's been popularized through like Dan, Dan Brown and history channels all, all over it about the secret life of Jesus and Mary, the Mary Magdalene could have been his wife. Well, it's found in the, in the Gnostic Gospels. The Gnostic Gospels are also written fairly plainly, so they're, they're easy to understand, whereas the Pisa Sophia, when it was first discovered, it's, it's a hard book to understand. But we'll look more at that. Yep, so it's hard to know any group through the eyes only of the people who are trying to eradicate them or to make them look bad. But that's all that, we, they, that scholars basically had or that we had that survived of ancient Gnosticism. So now we're going to talk about St. Paul of Tarsus. So the secret Gnostic teachings of Jesus remained hidden. While the teachings of Paul of Tarsus, today known as an apostle, though he was not, nor had he ever met Jesus, became the foundation of the Orthodox Christian Church. This became the public aspect of the teachings in which the parables and some of the stories were taken literally and meant historically. In the, in the New Testament, um, I forget the exact number right now, but Paul of Tarsus is said to, I believe, written 14 of the 27 books that are contained in there. All the letters and the epistles were written by Paul, St. Paul. Um, he, he was a Roman. And before he be converted to Christianity, his job was to persecute Christians. And then he was on his road. He was on a road walking to go and persecute disciples of Jesus for spreading Christianity when he said he was 
struck by lightning and the Lord came into him and he converted to Christianity and Orthodox Christianity or the New Testament is mostly made up of the, the, the writings of this man for a large part of the, the Gospels aren't and, and it's fairly interesting there is one book in the New Testament that is, is much different than, than the rest of them and it is Gnostic in its content I don't know if you're familiar with the New Testament but if anyone want to take a guess there, there's a really strange book in the New Testament it seems like it doesn't belong there. No? It doesn't. It's, it's the book of Revelation. It, yeah, the Revelation of John. It, it's very, if you read the other books, it, it's kind of strange. The symbolism in it is strange. It's hard to understand. The seven, it's the book of the seven seals. It talks about this. Seven seals being the seven chakras, the two witnesses, Ida and Pingala. It's very coded, but it's a Gnostic book that was extremely coded. So they thought it was kind of like a Judgment Day book, so they just left it in. Didn't quite understand what it meant, so they didn't alter it all that much either, which is interesting. Okay, so we're back on Paul. Once the Apostle James the Just, who was referred to by Jesus as his brother, was murdered, the teachings of Paul were able to take off virtually unopposed. And it was not long after that the church was officially established, endeavoring to spread the teachings of the Bible as we know it today, in which the Nagamiti texts were excluded. So, what we're, what we're coming to see is there, there may have been two forms of Christianity. Even though there was lots of different types of Christianity, there was two forms. There was the form that became orthodox, and there was the more esoteric form of Christianity, the more uh, Gnostic form of Christianity that was, at the time, led by James the Just, who was a brother of Jesus one of his brothers. After Jesus' death, he continued the ministry of Jesus. And in the New Testament, he is referred to as Jesus' brother. In the New Testament, Jesus is referred to having several brothers, one of them named Jude also. But then people say, oh, it's like maybe they were cousins, or maybe they were brothers in the sense that uh, Mary married jo uh, Joseph, but Joseph already had sons, so these are his brothers. There's a lot of trying to talk around what the words say. I know it's not good to take them literally, but literally it says they are his brothers. Early Christian Gnosis. So the impact that the life of Jesus had upon history is evidently significant. In his own time, he stirred up profound controversy and was condemned by many religious leaders who believed he was a threat to their traditions. Jesus, was <clears throat> Jesus challenged the common perceptions towards humanity and divinity, inviting the ordinary person to extraordinary possibilities. So some, sometimes we, we have these preconceptions about Christianity in general, like coming from a Catholic background, I have, now I have maybe not great feelings, or not good feelings at all towards like the Vatican or something like that, and sometimes the image of Jesus or the idea of Jesus gets lumped in with that. But a lot of these religious groups, and I'm, we're not attacking any of them, we're just saying that there is a message that the man delivered and then there was these outer shells that were, were built around that. These outer shells contained many different dogmas and ideas. Of, this is what Christianity is. This is these are rules and ideas that uh, the man himself never actually said that they should be rules. They never said you should go, you should build huge fancy churches. You should pay money to some priest so that you can confess your sins to him in my name. These are ideas that came upon later, almost 300 years after his death, even. But in his time, he was like a rebel, almost. The, it, he was in the Jewish community, obviously, being a Jew himself. And what he, what he was saying to them, they thought, this guy is actually a, a threat. He's telling people, almost, that, you know, look within, the, the work is on you. And we're trying to tell people that we're your, we're your holy uh, intermediary, in, intermediary between you and God, and you need us, so we have this position. And he's saying, you don't need an intermediary. Like psychics, interesting. Possible. <laughs> so what he was saying at the time was, very, was condemned as being very radical. And it went against <laughs> topical. So. so yet, even during his life, few grasped the deep meaning of his parables and symbolic teachings. Commenting to his small group of disciples, he said, and this is in the New Testament, this is in it. To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables, 
that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. And then Christians who will read this book will say, no, well, we are the ones that it's given to. We're the ones who it's not given to in parable. But here he's telling his disciples that he, tells, he was telling them directly one thing. And to the others, he was, he was hiding it, parable, in story form. So that those who were ready to receive at that time, which was a very radical teaching against the Orthodox Jewish Church at the time, they would see it, they would understand it because they were at a certain point, and he told it in parable. So it's interesting now that some of the parables that were also later then told about him became taken as historical fact. Like parts of his life are now taken as historical fact. Like driving the merchants from the temple is, is a pretty popular one to talk about because uh, the, the Jews in that time were very serious about the religion like they are now. And as many people say, there would never be a marketplace in a Jewish syn synagogue. It wouldn't happen because it's very holy to them, especially one in Jerusalem. So saying, what is this parable? Well, he drives all the merchants from inside the synagogue or the temple. Well, it's a parable. He drives the, the merchants being the ego, the temple being himself. The whip that he's using to whip merchants with is will, is the willpower. So people historically thought, well, no, Jesus got really mad. He picked up a whip and started whipping people to get them out of the temple. It's kind of a strange idea of trying to see that happening. But is it parable? It is a parable. <laughs> it makes more sense of as a parable. Even some of the things in his life that may have historically happened need to be looked at from a perspective of a parable to see that he was living a cosmic drama. We will get more out of it by, just, by looking into it as a parable, <coughs> trying to see, well, what did it represent? And instead of saying, no, it was a historical fact, because then you get things like um, Jesus died on the cross for our sins and now we're all saved. But I don't, that's, that's a position taken by Christian groups. I don't understand exactly what it means. Does it mean that we can do whatever we want and when we die, we're saved because he came and it's not very well explained. To look at this. <laughs> so, and then another parable is the, the I'm not, not sure how familiar people are with the New Testament. It's not even necessary that you are. But um, in this culture, some people are familiar with it. So the first parable that's told, the first historic event that Jesus does is he goes to a wedding, he turns water into wine. This is, this is a parable for the alchemical process, if you, if you look at what's involved. There's a wedding, a union between a man and a woman, and the turning of water into a higher substance, the turning of wine into wine. So these are parables. And uh, so now we start to see that even Jesus, when he, when he was on his ministry, he gave one level of teaching openly and a different level of teaching to his close apostles. And that is what we're learning from this statement here. So Gnosis was taught this way during the time of Christ, and also whenever else it was given, because the nature of the teaching so challenged the opinion of the day throughout all the ages in which it appeared, that often for concern of ridicule or even death, it had to be taught in secret and contained in seemingly incomprehensible perils, parables, myths, legends, and even art and music. This is why through the medieval time when there was a real threat of being executed at the stake or anything else for studying heretical beliefs, they hid it under certain systems like medieval alchemy. It was given as parables, as, as a, a cover story of what oh, we're trying to turn, turn physical lead into actual physical gold. And then they had all these words like salt for salt and mercury. These all related to deep, deeper esoteric teachings. The mass of people formed the Orthodox Church, and throughout the centuries branched off into the many different forms of Christianity we see today. However, Jesus demonstrated through the events of his life and death how to actually walk the spiritual path, illustrating in a real way how each person can die, resurrect, and be born again through the secret techniques he taught in parables <coughs> and showing how man can become a god and obtain immortality. So the mass of people form the Orthodox Church is being promoted by the emperor at the time. But it, it's also well documented that the emperor, at the time he supported, how does he maintain political power? He's supported by the legion or the army. So the army at the time, none of them accepted Christianity. They thought of it as, as like, um, some, some sources say they thought of it as more of a feminine religion, where the, 
where the, the soldiers, they all practice still some of the ancient mystery cults, cults of Isis, and a big one was called the uh, uh, cult of Mithras. So, and there is a lot of parables between some aspects of Christianity and some of these other cults. Like on, on when this Council of Nicaea happened, this is also when they decided what dates would become special in Christianity. This is when they said, we'll worship on Sunday. Sunday will be the day of worship for Christians because they wanted to separate it from Judaism. It's Jesus, the day of, the day of uh, worship for him was Sunday, because, or Saturday, because he's Jewish. So the Sabbath, and he, and he kept the Torah, like the commandments, uh, the Ten Commandments, one of them being that you keep the Sabbath holy. The commandment isn't to keep Sunday holy, it's the Sabbath, which in Jewish tradition is Saturday. And that's also when you also discover the... Yeah, it's true. Mm -hmm. yep. It's also you discover when they, when they put the date of celebration of Jesus' uh, 24th of December, because that's the winter solstice. They would line up some of the dates, or most of the dates, that would become important to Christianity with dates that were already important to, to the Roman pagan religions. That's why most of these dates fall on solstices or equinoxes. So, and so there were those who joined the orthodox or public aspect of Christianity and those who understood the true meaning of Jesus' words and life. And in this way, the church grew and spread the teachings of Jesus and those seeking spiritual truth had the opportunity to find Gnosis. This opportunity was left to them through the parables in Jesus' life. This is what this artist is denoting, the, the church of the dead word, looking for the truth and not finding it in the church of the living word. This is a, jo a Jofra painting. So the, who, who are the ones in the white signifying the Christians, the Orthodox Christians? Or those who knew the true uh, teachings of Jesus, those who knew the, the Gnosis, the Gnosis yeah. those who uh, understood the parables. They didn't have to directly know Jesus, but if they understood the parables, the, the stories were telling, or if they understood that, no, they didn't need an external church telling them how to worship and how to believe, but that they could directly experience the divine for themselves or these phenomena for themselves, it would be those people, the seekers of the truth. A lot of people, and it's not like, this is, this is how life is, it's not false, they don't have much push when they, they go to church and the priest says something and they listen and it's a nice day out or maybe it's boring for them and then for them, they, that's their Sunday and then they go about the rest of their week and there's no real push to drive towards spirituality, and for some people there's a real drive to understand spirituality. So that could be the difference also. So now we're going to look at the Gnostic texts themselves that were found in the Nag Hammadi Library. And this is what they uh, look like. Mm -hmm. So as you see, they're all tattered. tattered, and this space is missing. So in the translations, they also appear like that. So there, there's one <laughs> interesting one that in the Gospel of Mary, and uh, one of the disciples is saying, Mary, tell us what the Savior told you because we know that you were his favorite because he told us how much he loved you and he kissed you often on your, and then it's cut out what it was. Whether he kissed her often on her, but it's from furthest, probably lips or head or something like that, right? But it was showing that there was a deeper connection between Jesus and Mary Magdalene than there was even with the rest of the disciples. But, so it's interesting. Yeah, she was one of the disciples. She was one yeah. of the disciples. Yeah. She was one of the disciples and one of the more advanced disciples. Yes. There was not all the disciples were at the same level because no. some of them couldn't understand That's right. his teachings at all. And, yeah. and uh, Peter was one of those that could not understand. Right. Yep, some, some of them were, but in, in the, the Gnostic tradition, it's true, there were some disciples who were more advanced. Mary Magdalene is one of the most advanced. And also, mm -hmm. <clears throat> in some traditions too, and it's shocking for people to find out about Judas Iscariot, is said to be the most advanced. Yes. That he was playing a part because he realized that this man Jesus incarnated the Christ with the purpose of living out for people to see the cosmic drama that we all must go through internally. Yes. Sacrificing ourselves upon the cross of Elkhu. Judas Iscariot was playing a part. And this was this is very opposed to what any Orthodox Christian group believes. Yeah. That Judas no one would say Judas Iscariot, they would all say, nope. He's Judas. He's the one who turned on the Lord. He's the worst one. No. The Gnostics know he was the most advanced, and he understood at a deeper level, level 
what this cosmic drama was, and he knew his part in it, where he other disciples may not have. Yeah, and he knew what was going to happen to him, because yep. uh, he knew the rest of the disciples stoned him to death. Like, oh. Yeah, there's, yeah, yeah. There's, there, there's, there's many different stories as to what happened after with Jesus, yeah, if he stoned to death, or if he was so ashamed of himself that he hung himself as another one. But, yeah. I don't think there's, he was so ashamed, because he no. knew he played an right. important part. And this is what the Gnostic text Yes, yeah, and mm-hmm. also the Nox, Gnostic text, it says that... Uh, but he, Judas had a, a conversation with Jesus before that. In, About not wanting to participate in it. Yeah. Yes, but also uh, he also had a vision of, of being on the other side with the holy, the higher. Right. And he said he wanted to be there. He says, well, you do this, you know, and you will be there. Because, and he says, well, if I do this, I know I will be killed. He says, yeah. But, you yeah. know, he was sacrificing himself. Right. Yep. Yeah. And Jesus himself, too, when he incarnated the Christ, he also knew what his role was. Yeah. This explains some of the things that he said when he's praying fervently before he knows he's going to be taken. And he says, if it's possible, take this cup from me. He says something like this while he's praying. Take this cup from me, but if, if it is your will, let it be done. Saying, I'm scared. I don't want to go through with this. If this cannot happen, please allow that. But if it's your will, then let it be done. Also in the Gnostic tradition, they understood, and I've heard some scholars talk about it, and they seem to not quite understand it exactly, but they say, oh no, they think Jesus was two beings because they said he didn't actually die on the cross. <coughs> well, what happened on the, did the Christ die, like physically die on the cross? No. The, the body of the man Jesus did. Mm-hmm. So, the Gnostic tradition said, but when he was hanging on the cross, right before he died, he says that, famous, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those are the last, last words he says and dies because they say that the Christ or the force had left him because it doesn't die, only the physical man dies, and that's why he says this. Or in the Gnostic tradition, they say that the spirit or the Christ appeared above the cross in an, like an apparition, looking down at the body of Jesus dying and was laughing because it knew that it was indestructible. So this was the Gnostic tradition back then, and these stories are in Nag Hammadi Library, and these are the kind of stories that were attacked by the church fathers, they're saying. What, they said that he didn't die, that he appeared above his cross laughing at himself and all this other nonsense, and we don't know what they're talking about. What they are talking about was the inner being, the actual Christ, his higher being had left. And that was what was not really laughing at him. Well, no, he physically appeared laughing at him, but that they thought that they could kill the Christ, but the man died, but not the spirit or the soul. It was there again. So back to the Gnostic text. The texts of the Nag Hammadi Library show a teaching of Jesus that is opposite to that which we now identify as Christianity. These texts contain stories about Jesus' childhood, explanations of the divine realm, revelations, esoteric accounts of the Genesis story that's found in the Old Testament, in many peculiar terms that are only found in Gnostic texts, such as aeons, logos, archons, light being, the pleroma, and the mystery of the bridal chamber. It's all talked about in these Gnostic texts. So, a lot of these terms, they seem very strange to us, and we're not very familiar with them. The Epistle Sophia, when it was first translated, it has uh, ter- terminology like this throughout it. So it could be hard for people then to figure out exactly what they're... They were talking about at the time for scholars who were trying to uh, translate it. But in the Nag Hamid, uh, the ancient Gnostic text in the Nag Hamid library, it talks about very plainly what these aeons are, what the archons are, light beings. It's kind of those explanations of that, the divine realm. And um, we can understand it a little bit because of a little bit of the background we have in the Tree of Life. It was their way of explaining certain things that exist in the Tree of Life. The logo is being something like something similar along the lines of the Sephiroth of the Tree of Life. Uh, the Pleroma was everything above the physical world. It was the manifestation that came down from God, and that everything that was from this point down to the physical world. They called all of it the word Pleroma. It meant like the divine beings, the divine realms, the dimensions, the deities, the evil beings, anything that existed above the physical world. So, and they also have this. Uh, interesting terminology that come up quite a bit, the mystery of the bridal chamber, which was alchemy, the teaching of alchemy. So although the numerous Gnostic texts were written by numerous authors, there exists 
and then unifying and recurring themes. This is why they were probably all branched together in these 52 tractates. They weren't all written by the same people by any means, but they all had recurring themes or, or uh, theological ideas that made them the same. These themes have come to be known as the tenets of Gnosticism by, by the scholars, uh, university scholars who study what Gnostic text, what constitutes a Gnostic text. Some of what they include are the following. In these books, there's always the idea of dualism. There's a, there's a difference between matter, physical matter, and the spirit. There's a, a strong difference between the physical world and the divine world. So these are separate, and they almost looked at the physical world negatively and the divine world as what needs to be aspired to. This was part of the Gnostic text. They also had the idea of the true God. The, a God that they said was completely spirit that was unknown by humans, but not only unknown, was also unknowable by humans. Whereas Christianity said God created the earth and this, and they say no, the true God, the real God, the God that created all, is, is so far from the place that we are that we don't know him, that he can't be known to us through our physical senses. Not only that, that he's, he's unknowable because it's too big. He supersedes the intellect, the emotional, he supersedes it all for us to understand what he was. That being the case, they also believed that the, the physical world was created by lesser deities and a lesser god. So they had an idea of a true god and a lesser god that created the physical world, almost what they viewed as a prison for the, the spirit. But it, if you read the text, like scholars will say, they believe that an evil god created the physical world, but if you read the text, the text, it doesn't really say an evil God. It says it was a God that was ignorant of who it was and where it came from. It was like the first creature ever created almost. Same idea as the, uh, the Kabbalistic, remember it was the big man, the first thing ever made. This is kind of the yeah, same idea. It was made, it saw nothing but matter, and it started to create with that matter, and it thought, I'm God, because it had no clue of where it came from, created the physical world. We'll, we'll look into it a little bit. Uh, they, they all believe in a divine realm that exists concurrently with the, with the physical realm. Also meaning that you didn't wait to be saved. You didn't wait to go to heaven by dying. You had to find it here and now. So they believed in the divine realm, which they called the Pleroma. Uh, they believed in one source, one unknowable true God from whom issued all the divine emanations, all the beings, the angels, the hierarchies, uh, the really high <laughs> elevated beings, that were the benevolent beings, they had a name for them, they called them the eons or the aeons. So these texts have the idea of the divine spark, that part within man that is totally spiritual but trapped in matter. So we see a lot of these are, are very contrary to what Christianity today says. Christianity today says you have faith in Jesus and you will be saved because you already have a soul. They didn't, they didn't believe that we did not have a soul, but we had a divine spark, a peace that came from the absolute that we could fan into a flame and that we, could, that we would have to work on to incarnate the higher parts of our being, to incarnate the soul. Uh, they believed in redemption, but as in, through a different way than regular Christianity. They believed the liberation of the, uh, of the divine spark through gnosis, or self-knowledge. That correct knowledge brought liberation, not that Jesus' physical death brought liberation. They believed in div uh, the divine uh, emissary, which means that an aeon, or a being higher, which they believed Jesus, is, but when he got the title of Christ, they believed that the aeon descended into him, must ascend to impart the true knowledge to huma humanity because humanity needed to be led. This knowledge was very difficult for them to come on by their own accord. <clears throat> and they, they all have the same ethics within these 52 tractates, which is an ascetic lifestyle, which is the practice of self-denial as a spiritual discipline. So when the church fathers said that they were a wild wild and lascivious, and then these texts come out, we find that they weren't. They were very ascetic, that they 
they, they had a view of self-denial towards the physical body, not only that, but towards the physical realm. So they tried to uh, deny certain uh, physical things that we would consider pleasure because they believed these were trappings of the physical world that deterred them from knowing uh, the, the divine spark within them. So this is just a couple of them. There were some other, but these are the, are the bigger ones that are found throughout the 52 tractates. So now we're actually going to start talking about the Gospels. The first one we're going to look at is also the most famous one. It was the first one that was ever translated from the Nag Hammadi Library. It's called the Gospel of Thomas. The most well-known of the Nag Hammadi texts is the Gospel of Thomas. It was the first uh, manuscript that was translated from Coptic, and you can perhaps imagine the translator's surprise to uncover those first incredible words. These are the sacred sa the secret sayings which the, living, which the living Jesus spoke and which Didymus Judas Thomas recorded. These are the first words translated from the Nag Hammadi Library. These are the sacred, the secret sayings which the living Jesus spoke. And they thought, well, we have something on our hands. <laughs> this is something important. Now we're going to look at some of... Uh, the Gospel of Thomas is an important text found in the Nag Hammadi Library because it contains 114 sayings of Jesus that were previously unknown. What this, what this Gospel is, is just straight 114 sayings of Jesus. They're in no particular order, but they're also never found in the New Testament. And they're, they're generally short, too. Very interesting. But many of them uh, challenge the Orthodox belief that one is saved through faith in Jesus, and instead claims that one is saved by acquiring the correct knowledge regarding the sayings of Jesus. So where the Orthodox Church says, uh, through your faith shall you be saved, not through your works. They say, no, it's the opposite. You have to understand these teachings. This is what brings salvation. Not the death of Jesus did not bring salvation to people. Work on the self, understanding the self, is what brings salvation. So the author of the text identifies himself as Didymus Judas Thomas. So this is very interesting. The word Didymus means twin in Greek, and the word Thomas means twin in Aramaic. So the person's real name was, was most likely or probably Jude or Judas. And the title therefore calls him Jude the Twin. In the New Testament, Jesus is said to have brothers. One is named Jude. The Gospel of Thomas appears to have been written by the twin brother of Jesus, which is a tradition that's found in the Gnostic Gospels, that Jesus actually had a twin brother. His name was Jude. And this is who is claiming to have written the Gospel of Thomas. Now we are going to look at some of the sayings. This is the first saying. Whoever finds the interpretation of these sayings will not experience death. This is the saying of Jesus from the Gospel of Thomas. The church says, no, you have to have faith in Jesus. And through your faith you're saved. And he says, from the, words, from the mouth of Jesus according to the Gospel of Thomas, nope, you're saved by finding the interpretations to these sayings, to the sayings of Jesus. Jesus said, let him who seeks continue seeking until he finds. When he finds, he will become troubled. When he becomes troubled, he will be astonished, and he will rule over all. So the Christian church also said that Jesus was, was God. It was always a strange thing for me to try to understand, raising Catholic, that there's God, and there's Jesus, and there's the Holy Spirit, but they're all the same person and the same thing. But I was very confused about that as a child, and then when I became older, I, I gave up thinking about it entirely. Because <laughs> I don't understand how that is. But he's, Jesus says, uh, when he becomes troubled, he will be astonished, and he will rule over all, saying that the seeker, if you're seeking spiritual truth, keep seeking. When you find it, you'll be astounded, and once you're astounded, you can rule over all. The church doesn't want a message like that no. to be out, because they don't want you to think that you could be on par with Jesus, or that they, politically, they need to have their jobs. They need to be the intermediary between you and, and God. So this is an idea... I'm, like, I'm not trying to tell them, this is an idea of why these texts may not have been found in the New Testament, mm -hmm. even though they are just as old and they are claimed to be written by apostles. Because, right there, Jesus in the New Testament, in today's tradition, they said that there's 12 apostles and there's only four Gospels written by them. They said apostles, but those Gospels also were written maybe. The, the, the latest one, they believe, 
The, the oldest one in the New Testament is the Gospel of Mark. We think it was written uh, maybe a generation after Jesus' death. So the, there is a, kind of like a misconception also sometimes that these are written by actual, the New Testament may have been written by actual apostles who walked with Jesus. It may not be the case. It's back to the Gospel of Thomas. He claims to have walked with Jesus, as the opening said. He, he claims that these are the secret sayings of Jesus, that the living Jesus spoke while he was alive, and that he recorded. This is, a, this is a pretty big one that you find in there. Jesus said, The kingdom is inside of you, and it is outside of you. When you come to know yourselves, then you will become known, and you will realize that it is you who are the sons of the living Father. But if you will not know yourselves, you dwell in poverty, and it is you who are that poverty. So this saying is calling everybody to know themselves so they can become sons of the living Father, just like Jesus was himself. So he's calling people to be reach the same level that he did, perhaps, which is maybe opposed to what today's idea of Christianity says about Jesus. But also that the kingdom is inside of you and it is outside of you. So it's existing internally inside you now, this outside of you. Not that you have to die and then go to heaven, <coughs> that it's here and now, but... <coughs> Excuse me. So this, these, these are the, uh, the numbers that the sayings appear in. Uh, the Pharisees and the scribes have taken the keys of knowledge, the gnosis, and hidden them. They themselves have not entered, nor have they allowed to enter those who wish. This is him criticizing the scribes and the Pharisees of the day, saying that they didn't understand the true teachings of what would then be the Torah, and that they have also skewed it so that others can't understand it. But Jesus said, It is to those who are worthy of my mysteries that I tell my mysteries. This is inferring that he did have, perhaps, a public teaching and a secret teaching that he gave to his disciples. <clears throat> his disciples said to him, When will the kingdom come? Jesus said, It will not come by waiting for it. It will not be a matter of saying, Here it is, or there it is. Rather, the kingdom of the Father is spread out upon the face of the earth, and men do not see it. So these, some, many of these sayings are very powerful. And in a, in a small amount of words, you can see how, how opposed they are to what Orthodox Christianity is today. But it's also a deeper understanding of spirituality. Another book we're going to look at was called The Apocryphon of James. The Apocryphon usually means like a hidden book or a, a book that wasn't known. There, we're only going to look at a few of them. I don't know, maybe maybe four or five, but there are 52. But these are ones that I thought were maybe a little on the important side. So according to this de uh, text, the Apocryphon of James, Jesus appears to the disciples 550 days after his resurrection and takes Peter and James aside to fill them and give them his final teaching. He then ascends to the Father's right hand. So it claims to be written 550 days after the resurrection of Jesus. These are events that are claimed to happened after Jesus died on the cross. Same with the book, The Piss of Sophia. It also has teachings that are said to occur up to the beginning, 11 years after the resurrection, where he taught his disciples, and well, this is strange. What does this mean? How does he teach his disciples after his death? And it was, the idea was that they were being taught or guided by the Master Jesus in the astral. The revelation given to them is said to be meant not for the disciples, but for the children who will be born later. And this is, some of what is said may have two meanings. It can be taken literally, like, well, it's going to become important to generations down the road, or maybe this final teaching wouldn't become important to them until they incarnated their Christ, which comes as a, as a child born through the alchemical works. This is what, what he told them, and they were a little bit troubled by it at the time because they thought, well, we want you to give us a teaching for us so that we can, in the, in the book, they said. <clears throat> this is from the Apocryphon of James. The disciple said, have you departed and removed yourself from us? But Jesus said, Jesus said, no, but I shall go to the place from whence I came. If you wish to come with me, come. They all answered and said, if you bid us, we come. And then Jesus said, verily I say unto you, no one will ever enter the kingdom of heaven at my bidding, 
but only because you yourselves are full. So you can see that he was saying there is work that we have to do on ourselves to be able to enter the kingdom of heaven, to become full, to build the, the solar bodies, to build the higher bodies, to incarnate the inner being. Then we come. And this one would probably be particularly dev damning to the Orthodox yeah. Church because they say no, everyone comes to the kingdom of heaven through faith in my bidding. In Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. He says, no one come at my bidding. He says the exact opposite. <coughs> they said to him, Lord, we can obey you if you wish, for we have followed you. Grant us therefore not to be tempted by the devil, the evil one. The Lord answered and said, what is your merit if you do the will of the Father and is not given to you from him as a gift while you are tempted by Satan? But if you are opposed by Satan and persecuted and still do the Father's will, I say that he will love you and make you equal with me and reckon you to have become beloved by your own choice. So what is he saying? This is something that is recurring even in Gnosis today. He's saying it's very easy maybe to think that we're holy if we locked ourselves in a room so that we didn't have to go outside and deal with the egos that came out. But he's saying, what's the merit in that? What have you learned? You can't hide from the defects. You can't, like, uh, yeah. And what is the merit if you do the will of the Father when you're not opposed by Satan? It's very easy to be holy under perfect conditions. Everyone can do it. It's very easy to say that I don't have any anger in me because there's nothing in front of you that makes you angry. But as soon as something makes you angry, and then you say, I'm, gonna, I'm working on that ego of anger, and you don't become an angry by your own choice, that's the merit. That's when you truly do the will of the Father. When your, your nature is telling you to do the opposite. When your baseness wants you to do the opposite. And you still, and you do the greater thing. When you eliminate the ego, instead of letting the ego control the way you live your life. Verily I say unto you, none will be saved unless they believe in my cross. Therefore become seekers of death, like the dead who seek for life. For that which they seek is revealed to them. As for you, when you examine death, it will teach you election. Verily I say unto you, none of those who fear death will be saved. For the kingdom belongs to those who put themselves to death. Become better than I. Make yourselves like the Son of the Holy Spirit. So what is he telling them? Put yourselves to death. Not telling them to go hang themselves or anything like that. Put their baseness to death. Put their material desires to death. Put the ego to death. This is something that we can all verify ourselves that this is hard and we're, we're afraid of it. We are afraid and it. We're afraid of putting the ego to death because we feel like we know it well. We feel like it's us. We're we comfortable. We are very comfortable. We've become comfortable. Yeah. We, we, we identify with it very much. Therefore, when we eliminate a part of the ego, we get scared. We say, no, that's not a part of the ego. That's a part of me. I am this. This is what I am. And I have eliminated a part of me. This is a fear that people have. Because we're so identified with the ego that we believe that we are it. This is not really the case. None who, f those who fear death will be saved. You have to put yourself to death to work maybe, on yourself. Maybe they're also, maybe it's also frightening to think, oh, if this is not me and I put this to death, then who am I really? You know, we get kind of caught. Right. You know? Because mm -hmm, we, we have a certain image of ourselves. Mm -hmm. We feel like that's how we are, even though objectively we might not even seem like that to anyone else around us, but we feel this is what we are and this mm -hmm. is who we are, and we all have a very easy time of feeling justified in the things we do and because this is our nature. It might not be the case. We'll look briefly at the Gospel of Philip. The Gospel of Philip is a compilation of short sayings and stories about Jesus. Uh, the dominant concern within this text is what is called the mystery of the bridal chamber. According to this Gospel, the problem of humanity arises from the separation of the sexes. When Adam and Eve became separated, the original androgynous unity was broken. The purpose of Christ's coming is to reunite Adam and Eve. This is something that you may have heard before from previous lectures and we were talking about and Master Samuel was talking about this kind of idea. It was, it was very interesting for me to, to read the Gnostic Gospels and study them because we see that much of what Samuel Moore was saying in his books is also part of ancient Gnosticism, although he himself, I believe, was never came in contact with these books. 
he died in 77, and the translations didn't come out until 77 or 78. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is from the Gospel of Philip. When Eve was still in Adam, death did not exist. When she was separated from him, death came into being. If he enters again and attains his former self, death will be no more. A bridal chamber is not for the animals, nor is it for the slaves, nor for defiled women, but it is for free men and for virgins. The animals, the bridal chamber not being for the animals, I have seen scholars where they say, well, they, they're talking clear laws about it here, that the Gnostics do not believe in any kind of bestiality or something vulgar like this. <laughs> but we can take it more like the animals, the animal passions. The bridal chamber is not for the lust or for the mm -hmm. desire. Nor is it for the slaves, the people who are slaves, to their desires, or as we modern also say, the ego. Nor for defiled women, but it's for free men and virgins. Um, meaning for people who are working spiritually. It doesn't have to be taken literally as meaning virgins. And free men, free from the ego. Women who are free from the ego and the desire. Powers do not see those who are clothed in the perfect light, and consequently are not able to detain them. One will clothe himself in this light sacramentally in the union. To the Gnostic, the powers were like the higher beings, but the higher beings who were involved in the operation of the physical world. So to them, they saw these powers not really as a, as a in a good context. They thought that these powers or higher beings were, were there to trap them in the physical world. So, and they're saying, those who are clothed in the perfect light, uh, the powers will not be able to detain them. How do you clothe yourself in this light? You work sacramentally in the union. So this language seems to be fairly plain. I don't plain. understand what, what it's saying. The union. To work sacramentally in the union is to work in alchemy. To work in sexual alchemy. The light that clothes the individuals who works in, uh, in the union will be the light of the solar bodies. Or, like I said, the powers to them were like a negative thing. It was like a way of saying like the deities who control the physical world won't be able to detain those who work on building the spiritual bodies. Oh, okay. So they won the, so if they build the spiritual bodies sacramentally or sacredly in the union or the bridal chamber, the powers that control the physical realm won't be able to control them. And they will be able to ascend to higher dimensions and higher realms. Mm -hmm. Okay. Those who say they will die first and then rise are in error. If they do not first receive the resurrection while they live, when they die, they will receive none. So this is a, another one that is diametrically opposed to what Orthodox Christianity yes. says. So, the resurrection, the birth, the second birth, to die to create those bodies. Basically the church's idea when it was made as a political system was to tell people be good citizens and be good people and then when you die if you're good your whole life you go to heaven yeah. and still today this is the idea that's maintained so in the Gnostic Gospels this idea is more prevalent do not wait to be saved you have to save yourself now and here why? because you yourselves are full not because someone has saved you already if woman had not separated from the man she should not die with the man his separation became the beginning of death. Because of this, Christ came to repair the separation, which was from the beginning, and again unite the two, and to give life to those who died as a result of the separation and unite them. But the woman is united to her husband in the bridal chamber. And did, indeed, those who have united in the bridal chamber will, will no longer be separated. So, what did he mean, uh, uh, the problem became, uh, started when uh, Eve separated from Talking about the separation of the sex, but now that with the separation of the sexes came the sexual conundrum, the problem of sexuality. So when the two separated, when they started to spill the sexual energies, then they fell. And this was the degeneration of humankind. So at one point they were androgynous. Right, that, that's like back in back into the, yeah. the separate races. Yep. But this could even oh, be talking true. more yes. about yes. the yeah. actual sexuality that has caused people to... Uh, breed the ego, right? Because if, if they had not separated, not even talking about the physical separation when they were androgynous, but even if they had not 
separated, they still remained separate sexes, but one being through the practice of like tantra or, or alchemical process, then they should not die, but physically die, no spiritually. Well, were they in one um, physical body then? At one time, long, long, mm -hmm. like back mm -hmm. along, yeah. they were. Okay. Yeah. So how did they multiply? Don't you yeah, th this was a lecture from yeah, yeah. Space B, but yeah, yeah, they were androgynous, and some of them multiplied like cells. Was the yeah, idea from some, or some yeah, yeah. And later on by budding, and then yeah. was the idea, which which um, is kind of hard to fathom. And I know the Theosophical Society talked a lot about that, about these ancient uh, civilizations in the process of the over millions of years about how people became two sexes and. I mean, that's but that's one of those things. That there's a lot of things they uh, they talk about like that. And there's a lot of things that, that can be confusing to me, like even it's just confusing. So at the time, now when we're at certain levels of understanding, it's we can take it on the deeper, longer ago history or the more relevant to ourselves now history, where the if the man and woman did not separate and if they did not fall together, then they would not die, not physically die, but spiritual death or lose their their solar bodies are higher beings. We're going to look at another important one that was called the Gospel of Truth. The Gnostic Gospel of Truth is one of the books that scholars were aware of through the writings of the Orthodox Church Fathers, but until it was discovered at the Nag Hammadi Library, they had never possessed an actual copy. So when they were attacking the Gnostics and their beliefs, they mentioned this book particularly by name. So the scholars knew that this book existed, but there was never a copy that they never had a copy because they thought they were all burnt or destroyed. But then the Nag Hammadi Library, it, there's a copy of it. It is thought to have been written by Valentinius, an early Christ, uh, Christian Gnostic who was from Alexandria, Egypt. They, they say it was written by this man because they think it follows the same style of writing that he wrote in, that kind of idea. So it doesn't really have a, doesn't, there's no real claim to authorship on the Gospel. It doesn't even really have a name. There's no title of it. It just starts off as the gospel of truth is. And then he says a sentence. So they use that first sentence to say what the gospel is called. So the, this uh, gospel doesn't contain anything regarding the birth, death, or resurrection of Jesus, but instead proclaims that Jesus has brought salvation by providing the truth that can free the soul from the material world. So it doesn't talk about his birth, his death, or his resurrection, but that he brought the knowledge to people how to free themselves from the material world. And that's how we save. The teachings put forward by the gospel of truth are diametrically opposed to those that we are now that are now dominant in Christianity. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to look at a couple of them. This is the Orthodox Church. And this is what the gospel of truth says. As this fancy diagram shows. <laughs> Orthodox Church. The world was the intentional creation of the true God and was therefore made good even though sometime down the road sin crept in and then there's the need for salvation. But it was intentionally made good by the true God. The Gospel of Truth maintains that the material world came about by a con conflict in the divine realm and was subsequently created by lesser divinities. Mm -hmm. That's one of the major differences between the two uh, theologies. Uh, the Orthodox Church says that Christ brought salvation by dying for the sins of the world. The Gospel of Truth claims Instead of that, Christ brought salvation by delivering the knowledge necessary to free the soul. So that his death was really played no factor into their belief as to how what was important to free the soul. The Orthodox Church said that people are saved by, uh, saved by God by faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus. The Gospel of Truth maintains that people are saved by receiving the correct knowledge about who they really are where they came from, and what they possess internally. So those are some of the major differences between the two. Now the gospel of truth. This is kind of, they're talking about the creation of the physical world. So ignorance of the Father brought about anguish and terror, and the anguish grew solid like a fog, so that no one was able to see. For this reason, error became powerful. It worked on its own matter foolishly. Not having known the truth, it set about with a creation, preparing with power and beauty the substitute for the truth. This is a Gnostic view on the creation of the physical world. They said they believed that there was 
a lesser deity. They believed that there was three primary logos or aeons that existed, that they all three of these powers needed to be united to make a creation. Their story says that one of these powers or forces wanted to make a creation without on, on its own, basically. So they made a creation outside of the Pleroma. So outside of everything that existed between here and above the physical world. So they said one of these powers created created something outside of the Pleroma, which is the physical world. So it created they created what they call and describe as a being called Yaldabaoth, which which comes up quite a bit in the Gnostic text. Now I'm not telling you to take it literally, or if this is their way of anciently describing metaphysics, or I'm just this is the stories that you find in the Gnostic gospel. They said Yaldabaoth came into being, and then it sensed itself and looked around and didn't know from where it came. It saw only seas of matter started making creation out of that matter and then said, I am the true God, which was the, the first sin because then the real God said, you are not, and your arrogance has led you to create a creation outside of the Pleroma or the Divine world. That's how they explained it. So this one is a little bit more poetic and it can be difficult to understand in parts. But this part is straightforward and we might be familiar with it. It says, it is within unity that each one will attain himself. Within knowledge, he will purify himself from multiplicity into unity, consuming matter within himself like fire, and darkness by light, and death by life. Talking about the necessity of people to become unity instead of a multiplicity. We can understand that in the terms of the ego. We're a multiplicity of psychological aggregates. Now we're going to briefly talk about the Pistis Sophia. Those were just some of the Gnostic Gospels. Like I said, there's 52 of them in the Nauka Media Library. Some of them explain in more detail and more easily understood some of the concepts I was talking about, especially when it comes into their idea of the creation of the world and, and some of the terminology they use, like aeons and aroma. But the Pisa Sophia is separate from the, uh, the Nauka Media Library because it's been around. They've had copies of it for longer. But when the Nauka Media Library was found, the Pisa Sophia is also part of the Nauka Media so the oldest copy of this was found in the Nag Hammadi Library. And interestingly enough, too, a copy of Plato's Republic was also found in the Nag Hammadi Library. So, Pisa Sophia. So before the discovery of the Nag Hammadi Library, the Pisa Sophia was the largest source of Gnostic teachings known to the world. It is an extraordinary work whose title means um, power wisdom or power of faith. They're not exactly sure what the word Pisa itself is. Meant there's a, a lot of people give a lot of different translations, but power wisdom or power of faith is most common. Because it was a name. It's a name of a person. The scale and esotericism of the text hid what on the surface was obviously a deep knowledge of spirituality from the early Gnostic tradition. It covers aspects of creation and delves into the process of awakening which the Gnostics possessed. Uh, this epic manuscript was purchased by the British Museum in 1795 from a doctor who had obtained it from an unknown source. It's kind of obscure as to where, how it came into circulation again. Finally emerging from uh, obscurity after having been banned in the 4th century at the Council of Nicaea. The writings themselves have been dated to 150 to 300 AD and were written in the Sahedic dialect of Upper Egypt, although originally composed in Greek. But it wasn't until the 1850s, over half a century after they were discovered, that work began on their translation. And this copy that I, that I have here, this is, was, was uh, translated by G.R.S. Mead. It's one of the earliest translations. Who knew. He was a theosophist. And, uh, theosophy is one of those movements throughout time that was concerned with Gnosticism. They, they taught Gnosticism just through a different name, you know, Theosophical Society. And, Kind of idea, but they were very much influenced by Gnosticism. So there's a picture here by uh, the Pisa Sophia unveiled by Samuel and Moore. So remarkably, the Pisa Sophia recounts events that occur only 11 years after Jesus' resurrection. During the previous 11 years, he had been teaching his disciples, both men and women, in Gnostic wisdom. 
Jesus takes his disciples on an astounding journey into the regions of the invisible worlds. Uh, here he instructs them and reveals many esoteric mysteries. In particular, he speaks of the story and repentance of the Pista Sophia, which is a symbolic part of each person's true being. So the main story that he tells, he gives them a story, and it's, a, it's about this being Pista Sophia that falls, and the work that the Pista Sophia does to rise back up to the light. In the Pista Sophia unveiled, Samael and War, at, interval, at intervals throughout the text, explains the meaning behind the words of Jesus to his disciples, and reveals many of the secret keys contained in this teaching. So, the Pista Sophia, um, like I showed you some of the quotes from the, from the Gnostic Gospels, the Gnostic Hamadi Library, we can directly relate with some of those quotes. They, they don't seem to be very too coded. We can, we can get information from them by reading them directly. The Pista Sophia is a little bit more of a book that's coded. Therefore, Samael and War spent a great majority of his efforts in decoding what some of it meant. And I believe before his death, he, he did unveil about 80% of the Pisa Sophia, but there was the last section of it that he didn't have a chance to unveil. So the Pisa Sophia is an extremely important Gnostic text, because at one time it was one of the only actually true Gnostic texts that survived. That we had a copy of until 1945, right? Uh, Samuel and Ward devoted a great amount of time and effort in unveiling the meaning behind the, igna uh, the enigmatic writings. The language of the Pisa Sophia can be difficult for the average person to understand. It seems to be coded or meant for readers who have a prior knowledge of the terminology. This is before the. I'll give you an example. And when I say uh, difficult for the average person to understand, it can be difficult for anyone to understand. This is how it starts. It came to pass, when Jesus had risen from the dead, that he passed eleven years discording, discoursing with his disciples, and instructing them only up to the regions of the first commandment, and up to the regions of the first mystery, that within the veil, within the first commandment, which is the four and twentieth mystery, without and below, those four and twenty which are in the second space of the first mystery, which is before all mysteries, the Father in the form of the dove. Oh my God! Yeah. This me. I don't yeah. that. <laughs> it's very coded and it's very oh, difficult yeah. to understand. So this is why Samuel and War at one time this was this is uh, the only Gnostic text. He spent a great deal of effort decoding it because wow. it's, it's not as straightforward as some of those no. quotes that we had previously heard. But Samuel and War explains it even with his explanations. This, the the Pisa Sophia is it's it's an advanced book. And it takes several reads to understand exactly what is happening. But so if you wanted to jump into Gnosticism, to Gnostic text, that might not be one to start, but it is an important one, <laughs> a very important one to study at some point. So the discovery of the Nag Hammadi Library brought forth revolutionary Gnostic teachings, which in some cases were easier to comprehend for the average person than earlier works such as the Pista Sophia. Survival of Gnosis. Small groups of people kept the Gnostic practice alive during the Dark Ages. Uh, Gnosis was practiced in secret sects and organizations throughout the ages. Uh, organizations throughout the ages, it has reemerged in the form of medieval alchemy, early Freemasonry, and early Rosicrucianism. These are some of the early forms that taught it in secret in the secret societies that taught some of the deeper Gnostic. Uh, systems, although today I would, I would say that it does, it's not as prevalent in any of these groups. These groups have degenerated over time, like many groups, and, uh, but very early on, that's what their focus was, was keeping Gnostic, it was part of their practice. So the Order of the Knights Templar, which is what this symbol is a symbol of, formed in 1118, used Gnosis as the foundation of their spiritual practices. So this is one of the earliest secret groups that may have used Gnostic teachings as the cent center of their spiritual practices, um, the Knights Templar. And they're, they're, they're gaining quite, becoming popular in modern times. There's lots of uh, myths about them and, and lots of stories and maybe Dan Brown. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but, yeah. Brown back to life. Yeah. yeah. Dan Brown, but I mean... Uh, they have been, the Knights Templar tradition 
actually in Freemasonry in the early years they actually merged and, and a lot of people in Freemasonry say well it's not true this is like alternative history but there is some evidence to back that up that that Freemasonry was originally born out of the Knights Templar after they were banned from the church there's a there's a the Dan Brown uh, shows that temple in Scotland uh, Roslyn Chapel that has mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, has the uh, Masonic symbols 200 years before Masonry exists, and it also has like Templar symbols 400 years after they were supposedly banned by the church. So that's one of the interesting things. So the persecutions continued, however, and in 1307, the Grand Master of the Knights Templar and many of his senior knights were arrested on charges of idol uh, idolatry by the King of France at that time and tortured. The remainder of the order are said to have fled to Lombardy, Scotland, Portugal, and the Baltic states. It was in Scotland that they are speculated to have founded two branches of underground Gnostic study, that of Freemasonry and that of Rosicrucianism. This story is one of those extremely interesting stories in history. The, the king at the time, uh, King Philip the Fair, he was greatly indebted to the Knights Templar because the Knights Templar also uh, formed what could be the, an early version of the banking system. So instead of instead of um, carrying around with you your treasure chest full of actual gold, you could go to a Templar uh, where the Templar knights were stationed. You could deposit your gold with them. They would give you a Templar note. You would travel to the next Templar station in the holy city, maybe Jerusalem. Give them the temp your Templar note. They would take that amount of gold out of their safe in that place and give it to you for cost. So it was a very early system of banking. Mm -hmm. Consequently, King Philip himself became greatly indebted to the Knights Templars. He owed them a lot of money. And so he had all these charges, said that they were uh, charges of idolatry. And basically, they were, char they were charged with not being Christian. They were charged with spitting on the cross, with practicing things. There were lots of uh, claims were thrown at them by King Philip homosexuality, all these things that the church used against them. Uh, but there was one unique charge, because these charges they, <laughs> he would throw at anyone who he opposed. He would throw the same set of charges at them, being non-Christian and spitting on the cross. But for this Knights Templar, there was one charge that was different, and that was the worship of something called Baphomet, which throughout time, people have drawn pictures of what they believe Baphomet is, but they're not exactly sure what it was referring to that they worshipped Baphomet. How did they come to become this rich order? Well, it was started with it started eventually with nine. It started with nine knights. They went to the Pope and they said, "We want to protect. We want to protect pilgrims." This is around the time of the Crusades now. We want to protect pilgrims who are moving to the Holy City. So, we were, they were a chivalric order. They were knights, and they said, "All we ask is that you let us lodge in uh, the temple, like uh, the Temple of Jerusalem." that time I believe was the last time it was created. At one time it was Solomon's temple, but anyways, when they were there, they, they dug. And there's evidence. In 1945, a group dug under the ground of the temple and they found Knights Templar artifacts down there. So they asked to be situated in a, sp a specific location in Jerusalem. Once they were there, they dug, they found something. Whatever they found, they then possibly used to blackmail the church and they became this phenomenally rich organization. There's a, uh, some people in the Masonic tradition, like Albert Pike, who says he believes what they found under the temple were Gnostic documents claiming either the lineage of Jesus or, or claiming an alternate history of Christianity that they used to blackmail the church. And then they were wiped out. It is unclear, however, exactly when the mystery schools began. These are the schools that started after the Templars, like Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism in particular. But the time is said to have been generally around the 15th to 16th centuries in Europe. Medieval alchemy also began around this time. It was characterized by an external or exoteric practice of converting lead into gold. However, the hidden form, uh, the pub or hidden, hidden from the public eye was the esoteric practice of converting lead or personality into the gold of the spirit. So there were groups, they then became initiatic, secret groups that practiced uh, these, uh, these older traditions. 
in the 15th and 16th centuries in the, in the Dark Ages when you were really in trouble if you were a heretic, when you would be sent to the stake and whatnot? Or was the Crucianism being one of the main ones? This type of alchemy that it, uh, this type of alchemy is that enshrouded in the visions and sayings of the ancient Gnostic texts with all their symbolisms. The bridal chamber mentioned in the Bible and in Gnostic writings refers to the tantric practice in which the philosophical stone of the al alchemist is formed. They are saying they also hid Gnostic teachings under the guise of alchemy in medieval ages. One of the most important uh, symbols that links these uh, later emergencies of not emergences of Gnosticism with that of its earlier roots is the symbol of the cross, which itself is a symbol of alchemy. Jesus was crucified upon the symbol, representing the death, resurrection, and transformation through the practice of Tantrism. The cross appeared in medieval alchemy, Rosicrucianism, and Freemasonry in the form of the Rose Cross, referred to as the Rose Cross Mystery. So even today, there's still the, that tradition of Freemasonry. There's a there's a lodge in the higher degrees called the Chapter of Rose Croix, which is a French way of saying the Rose Cross. Um, still exists, and you can see this is the symbol for the Masonic one, the cross with the rose and the initial I at RI. The meaning of these mysteries became lost over time, and so uh, too did the ability to understand them. In order to preserve them from destruction, they were shrouded in secrecy, and thus as those who were able to unlock their secrets became fewer and fewer, they became locked in the past. So there came a point even within, within these groups, like the Rosicrucian groups or Masonry, where they use, secret, they use these symbols. Even in all odds, too, they use the same symbols that they used back then. But the interpretation of these symbols may not be correct now. The true interpretation may have been lost in time. Or there may be those who just who are, uh, it's gone too long without being written down what it was first intended to mean. So now we have all these symbols that relate to Gnostic practices <clears throat> that may not be readable or understandable to the people who see them, like the Masons or the modern day Rosicrucians or whoever. Now we'll talk about Samuel on War briefly. Samuel on War was born with a mission to publicly reveal the keys to spiritual awakening. Those very same ones taught by Jesus almost 2,000 years ago. During Jesus' time, the secret practices of Gnosis had been hidden in parables and stories. But now they were to be given plainly <clears throat> and clearly so that anybody could understand them, and therefore everyone would have the opportunity to find Gnosis. So that you didn't have to try and decipher a book like the Pista Sophia on your own. He came with the mission of unveiling what has been veiled. <clears throat> what the alchemists were trying to say through symbols, he came to say through direct words. It was Samael then who was given the task to not, on, uh, not only to rediscover the spiritual path which Jesus had demonstrated during his life, but also to give afresh the ancient teachings of Gnosis for the modern age, to bring them back. And in the 1950s, he became a celebrated founder of modern Gnosticism. And if we study the Gnostic Gospels, because a lot of people like to say, or you say, well, I or this Gnostic group, like, oh, it's like modern Gnosticism. But we can say that some of the, the teachings that we find here from Samuel and War, they were in line with the teachings of ancient Gnostics practiced, but were unknown to us until the 70s, late 70s and the early 80s. And that will conclude this lecture.